Um, today, we're going to talk about what creates engagement. Anybody ever uh, had this reaction? <laughs> so many times our, our, our peers and our company and our boss says, you know, this needs to be a habit. We have to create, a, you know, we have to boost our engagement with this product. And typically what comes after this is, why can't we do it like so-and-so? Yeah. yeah, this guy, yeah, <laughs> exactly, right? And who fills in that blank? Well, it's typically a company that has come up over the past few years that took everybody by surprise. And it came out of nowhere. Maybe the first time you saw it, you said, okay, it's a nice toy. And with a blink of an eye, it changes the world. And the company's touching hundreds of millions of people and making hundreds of millions of dollars. What company comes to mind, or companies come to mind when I gave that definition? What comes to mind? Instagram. Pinterest? Instagram? Foursquare. Foursquare? What else? Twitter? Oh, Facebook. Right, the first time you saw Facebook? Come on. Did you know it was going to be Facebook? Not many people did. I call these kinds of businesses OMG businesses. These are businesses that fundamentally change the user behavior in new and sometimes very odd ways. And what I started to do over the past several years was look for patterns. I wanted to figure out what was it about these companies that so profoundly changed user behavior. And I started out with this fundamental question. By the way, before I move on, all these slides will be available afterwards, so you don't have to take pictures of So I started out with this fundamental question of, are these companies vitamins or painkillers? Has anybody ever heard this question from a VC? It's a question uh, an investor will love to ask. Because for those of you who may not be aware of the, of the dichotomy, you know, a painkiller is what investors love to, to invest in. right? Because a painkiller solves an obvious need. Right? It's a quantifiable market, it's monetizable, that's what investors want to invest in. It's a clear need. Stop the pain. Vitamins are a different story. Vitamins we consume because of an emotional need. We may not exactly know if it, if it works, but that's not why we take the vitamins. With vitamins, it's an unknown market. We don't exactly know what the need is before we start putting it out there. So here's my question to you. These companies we just talked about, that so profoundly changed user behavior. What are they? What are they selling? Vitamins or painkillers? How many of you think they're selling vitamins? Okay, how many painkillers? Okay, how many people didn't vote? <laughs> well, before you make up your mind, let me posit this thought. That a habit is when not doing something causes you a bit of pain. Habit is when not doing that behavior causes you a bit of pain. And so it was kind of a trick question when I asked, because I believe it, these companies are actually both. One of the characteristics of a habit-forming technology is that the consumer comes for a pleasure-seeking behavior, and the product becomes so important in the user's life, because it becomes a habit, that it becomes a pain only eating product. These companies create the need and sell the remedy. That's one of the characteristics of a habit-forming product. However, what are we talking about when I say pain alleviation? What do I mean when I say pain? It's not exactly pain. It's more of an itch. And if you want to experience that itch, let's do a little thought experiment. Everybody close your eyes for a second. Now imagine that someone has just sent you a message in whatever medium you use to be contacted by important people in your life. So maybe it's an SMS, email, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you use to get important messages. And I'm ruminating on that for a bit. It's sitting there, blinking at you, begging you to pick it, to, to answer it. Now bring awareness to how you're feeling right now and open your eyes. Tell me how you felt. Somebody give me, how does that feel? See some, what, how did you feel? Anxious. Anxious. What else? Curious. Curious. What else? A little excited. What about stress? Anybody feel a little bit of stress? Anybody feel, yeah. or anybody hear a little bit of tension? Yeah. yeah. See some nodding head? That's the itch. That's the association that habit forming products create in us. So, this habit that, that we're talking about, this itch, is when a behavior is done with nearly or no cognition. It's essentially an association between that emotion, that feeling that you just felt, and a behavior. 
and that negative emotion that you felt, that bit of stress, that itch, with a product. So my goal in this very brief introduction, and tomorrow I'm giving a three and a half hour workshop on this where we actually uh, you know, work with individuals' product ideas, my goal in this very brief talk is if your business model requires habits, and that being said, not every business does, plenty of businesses, uh, particularly those who are not in consumer web, do not require habits. There's lots of ways to acquire uh, customers and retain customers without habits, but if your business model does require habits, I'm offering you a pattern intended to help you form better hypotheses. Okay, how many of you are familiar with Eric Ries, Stephen Blank's customer development work? Okay. Most of you, right? Um, build, measure, learn. And so the most expensive part of the build, measure, learn loop, what, what's the most expensive part of build, measure, and learning? What takes the most time and money? The building, right? So if we can build the right stuff first, we can save a ton of money, a ton of time. And so that's what I want to help you do, is to inform better resource, or better hypotheses so that you build the right stuff first and build less of the wrong hypotheses. Okay? The goal here is to increase your odds of success creating your product. So how do we do this? So my methodology, my framework, my lattice is called the hook. The hook is an experience designed to connect your solution with the customer's problem with enough frequency to form a habit. Connecting your solution to the customer's problem with enough frequency to form a habit. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. Hooks take users from low engagement to high engagement. And every product, not just in consumer tech, that every product that is habit forming, that creates an association, you will see a hook inside. Okay? And the hook has four steps, four phases, kind of like a four-stroke engine. Those four phases are a trigger, an action, a variable reward, and an investment. And as you learn these, you'll start, if you look at these in your own life, you'll see these in lots of different products that are engaging, that hold our attention. And of course, let me just give you, if you learned one thing today, I want you to walk away with, remember this acronym, Atari, how many of you had an Atari growing up? Yeah, my generation, right? <laughs> this cartridges. So remember, a hook has four parts, trigger, action, reward, and investment. And as we all know, if you can make an acronym out of something, it must be true. <laughs> so, let's start out with triggers. Triggers are the first step in connecting your solution to the customer's problem. And the most important thing to know about designing new habits, new behaviors, is that behaviors don't come out of thin air. Does anybody know how a pearl is formed? How's a pearl formed? Yes. Yeah. What's that? Pressure. Pre actually, what do you mean by pressure? Is that a pearl inside an oyster? So it's actually, yeah, you know, sir? Sort of the grain of sand. Grain of sand. And then it gets into the oyster's mouth and just sits there kind of playing with it. Yeah. Putting saliva on it, basically. <laughs> So it starts with a grain of sand that actually irritates the oyster into putting layers of a substance called mother of pearl, and it gets formed one layer over another over another. And if you take a cross section of an oyster, you'll see it's like the rings of a tree. It's one layer over layer over layer. This is how new behaviors and new habits work. Every new behavior needs a foundation, needs a trigger. And triggers, these triggers in our life come in two different forms. There's two flavors, external triggers and internal triggers. An external trigger is where the trigger informs the context of what to do next. So these are alarms, calls to action, a store, an authority figure. These triggers, the designer, the trigger itself informs what to do next. The trigger tells you what to do. Whereas an internal trigger, which is where we're going with all this once we've cycled through the hook, is an emotion, a routine, a situation, a place. What's common about all these things? What to do next, the context of what to do next is inside the user's mind. The association has been formed. Okay? So let's take an example of an external trigger. In technology, in our world, a big fat hero button that says log in now. That's the context of what to do next is inside the trigger. That's the <coughs> external trigger. We're all very familiar with, as designers, around external triggers. What people aren't as conversant in is internal triggers. And it turns out that people's, uh, when people experience negative emotions, they often turn to something. They turn to a solution. So emotions, and particularly negative emotions, tend to be internal triggers. So where do we go when we feel lonesome or bored or confused? What do we turn to to get out of that state? 
to get out of feeling that emotion. Why, why do negative emotions so often come up as internal triggers? Because negative emotions are painful. They don't like feeling these things. And so we turn to something to get out of that state. And an example of this is actually a, a, a large study that was done at a university that showed that people who check email more, uh, or, I'm sorry, people who are depressed check email more. And they can actually predict someone's likelihood to have clinical depression based on their usage patterns of email. And so why does this happen? There's two possible hypotheses. One is that email makes us depressed. That's one hypothesis. The other is that people who are feeling depression feel these negative states more often. They were feeling these negative valence states, and they were looking to get out of those states. And this boost of, 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 a, positive, of a positive state got them out of that negative feeling. So think about it in your own life. When you feel lonely, what do you use? Many people use Facebook. Hungry, we use Yelp, we use Grubhub. When you're unsure, Google. When you're anxious, we use email. When we're lost, we use GPS. And when we're mentally fatigued, right, it's 2 o'clock, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we're working on a boring project, what do we do? We go somewhere else, right? We go check sports scores, we go check an interesting uh, online magazine, some kind of entertainment, maybe YouTube, something to lift us out of that negative state. So what does this mean as product designers? So the vast majority of the room works at a startup or, or building a product. The first step is to know your customer's internal trigger. Right? You need to be able to say this about your customer. Every time the customer experiences X, an emotion, a routine, a situation, a place, a person, every time they experience that, they use this product. If it's to become a habit, it needs to ha occur frequently enough that you can identify and pinpoint that, that need. So let's, let's do a quick example with Instagram. Anybody here use Instagram? Okay, fantastic. What, what, was, the, what was the last thing you took a picture of with Instagram? Um, my mom's garden. Okay, your mom's garden. Yeah. So she did, the, your mom's garden didn't say, hey, take a picture of me with Instagram, right? right? So there's no context for what to do next. The association of what to do next was in your head. Instagram had captured that moment. Right? That's an example of an internal trigger. What are their external triggers? How did most people hear about Instagram the first time? How did you hear about Instagram the first time? Facebook or Twitter. Right? That was their viral uh, distribution channel. Then once you installed the app, you started getting more app notifications. Then once you installed the app on your phone, you have the icon itself. The app icon is an external trigger. It's a great one to place. And then the more you used it, uh, oh sorry, and then the, 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 when you became conversant in the use of Instagram, why were you using it? What was the moment that Instagram was capturing? Well, for many amateur photographers, it was the, the fear of loss. It's the sense of, you know, I want to capture this moment before it's gone. And Instagram solved that pain point. Of course, there's a lot of other things they did right. right? But this is one of the things they did particularly right, was they captured that moment. Every time I fear that I'm going to lose that moment, I capture it with Instagram. And then it became bigger than that. Now it wasn't just about, the more you use Instagram, it wasn't just about that moment. It was also about the social network that was, that was created. So now I'm able to view what my friends are doing. I'm able to connect with others. I'm using it for other reasons. When I'm feeling bored, lonesome, fear of missing out, now there's other triggers that cause me to come back to Instagram. Okay. So in summary, trigger is the first step of the hook. The designer informs what to do next through external triggers and the user informs what to do next through internal triggers. And emotions provide frequent internal triggers. Okay? How are we doing so far, by the way? Any questions? Couple thumbs up? Good? Okay. Next phase of the hook, action phase. So we've triggered someone, now we need a simple action before the reward. That's the goal of the action phase, a simple action before the reward. And the action phase is all about when doing is easier than thinking. And let me show you what I mean. Has anybody seen the fog behavior model before? Who's, who's familiar with it? Oh, only one person. Okay, you love this. So, BJ Fogg is a researcher at Stanford. He studies persuasive technology as well. And he posits for any behavior to occur, B, up in the corner there, you need three things at the same time. Motivation, ability, and a trigger. For any behavior, you need motivation, ability, and a trigger. And this is a threshold, that above this threshold, we get the behavior. Below this threshold, we don't get the behavior. Motiv triggers, we know what that is, we just talked about it. Motivation, most people know what motivation is. 
an ability. Ability is how difficult or hard something is to do. Something is, uh, if something is very easy, it's way over here. Something is very hard, it's way over there. Okay? So if, we have, if, we don't, if something is too difficult or motivation is too low, we fail. If something, if, we have, if something is easy to do and we have plenty of motivation, we get the behavior. This isn't just in technology products, it's the across the board with everything we do. So let me give you an example. When was the last time, think in your own life, when was the last time that a phone rang and you didn't answer it? Give me an example. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> well, why didn't you answer it? I'm an appointment. You, what's that? I'm an appointment. You're an appointment. Perfect example. Okay, so maybe it was a really important call, right? So your motivation was super high. You heard it, so the trigger was there, but it was too difficult. You couldn't pick it up because it was socially awkward. You couldn't pick it up right now. Your ability was too low. What's another reason? Yeah. I was staying at my parents' house. Okay. I don't need to Oh, it's not, it's not for you. Perfect example. So the phone rang, trigger. Super easy to pick it up, it was right there, right? But it's not for you, so your motivation is too low. Maybe it's a telemarketer, so your motivation is super low. The behavior doesn't occur. What's one more reason having to do with triggers? Yeah? Okay, so maybe your motivation is too low. What's, what's another reason it has to do with triggers? Yeah? Wearing gloves, so maybe that makes it too difficult, right? So your ability is too low. Your motivation is high, you heard the call, but you're, it's too difficult to answer. Yeah. Didn't hear the call. Didn't hear the call. Maybe it's on silent. So you really wanted to pick up the call. It's really easy to pick it up. You heard, it's, it's you know, right next to you, but it just didn't ring. The phone was on silent, and so no trigger appeared. So any behavior, motivation, ability, and trigger, everything you design with your app, your website, motivation, ability, and trigger, every action has to have sufficient quantities of those three things. There are lots of different models on behavior. I think VJ is one of the easiest uh, to use because it, it's just so simple and practical and it's easily communicated with the organization. So let's dive into these three elements. Motivation. Motivation, according to Edward Desi, the father of self-determination theory, is the energy for action. And according to Dr. Fogg, there's six motivators. There's six key motivators for behavior, which are seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, seeking hope, avoiding fear, seeking acceptance, avoiding social rejection. So these are six levers that we can pull to increase motivation or decrease motivation. So I'm going to give you a pop quiz here. One of, the, one of the best examples that we can see of motivators in action is in advertising, is in the realm of marketing. So I'm going to show you some ads. Tell me which motivator is being used. Okay? The first one is easy. Right? Even without the words. Where is the president looking to? The future. Exactly right. Okay, here's another one. Tell me what motivator is being used. Pleasure, exactly right. So, for the, hamburgers have nothing to do with sex, but obviously for this demographic that they're selling to, that's a key motivator, that's associated with pleasure. Here's one more. What's being sold? Social acceptance, exactly. It's hanging with bloods, right? Not a coincidence called blood, right? Social acceptance. So we've got motivation, ability. Ability is the capacity to do a particular action capacity to do. So how do we increase or decrease the capacity to do something? Well, here again, there's also six factors. So these are six other factors that we can move along this continuum. So if you want to make something harder or easier, adjust these six things. Make something take more time, cost more money, uh, require more physical effort, more brain cycles. Right? So these are six social deviants and non-routine. These are six things we do that can make something difficult, or easy. And online, where we see these, these simple actions in anticipation of reward, we see these as a login into Facebook, a search on Google, uh, a simple open on twi Twitter, or an SMS, or an email, a scroll on Pinterest, or a play on YouTube. Okay? Very simple actions in anticipation of the reward. The simplest thing you can do in anticipation of the reward. A lot of the companies I consult with, this is a big problem. Because they put so many steps before the user gets anything back that the user never makes it. Huge problem. Let's look at how Twitter faced this challenge. Here's Twitter 2009. Take a good look. Twitter 2010. Twitter now. What's changed? What's, what's happened? Got rid of a lot of noise. Why do they do that? 
and made it much simpler, right? They're homing in on how many big buttons do they want you to push on, right? If you don't have an account, three lines push sign up. If you have an account, now it's only one button, right? Anything else that sticks out there, anybody? Looks magical now. It's this fantastical place in the back. Uh, so this, it's, I'm sorry it's so hard to see with the light, but this is a bunch of people, maybe you've seen this when you logged in this, but it's a bunch of people looking down at something, there's some kind of light coming out, there's some kind of event going on here. All right, they're using the motivator of, I think, social cohesion of what's happening. Uh, you know, the fear of missing out. I want to know what's going on. They really honed in on that messaging of what the product is for. And of course, find out what's happening right now with the people and organizations you care about. You know exactly what the program is, or the, the software is for. Okay? So in summary, action is the second step of the hook. Action is the simplest behavior that we get the user to do in anticipation of the reward. To increase behavior, number one, ensure that your trigger is present, then increase ability to make it easier, and make sure we align with the right motivator. Okay? We're halfway through the hook. Next is variable reward. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Happy? Yeah. So next is variable rewards. If we talk about rewards, we have to start with the brain. And in particular, a part of the brain almost at the set, dead center of your head called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens was uh, discovered, more or less, by uh, two scientists by the name of Olden Milner back in the 1940s, who discovered when they stimulated lab animals in this particular part of the brain, and then gave these animals the ability to trigger them, or to stimulate themselves, they did so incessantly. So these lab animals would run across an electrocuted grid and experience severe pain to get that stimulation. They also did these experiments implanting these electrodes in people, can't do that anymore, um, but uh, they got the same result. People would incessantly click to stimulate themselves. Well, it turns out we can't build products that put electrodes in people's heads, thank goodness, but it turns out that we can stimulate them through this and we're all stimulated through these things. Things that feel good, things that we want, things that we crave, are things that stimulate our reward systems. They also stimulate the new discomforts. But here's the thing. Olds and Milner thought they were stimulating pleasure. They thought they had found the pleasure center of the brain. And it turns out that's not exactly what was going on. More recent uh, neuroscience actually revealed that what they were stimulating was what we call the stress of desire. So this is a cross-section of an fMRI of someone's head as they're anticipating a reward. And what you see lighting up here is the nucleus accumbens, right? It's the dopamine pathways in our brain in anticipation of the reward. And watch what happens after the reward is received. That behavior, or that, that stimulation stops. So what Olds and Miller were stimulating was not the pleasure centers. Actually, pleasure occurs in a different part of the brain. They were stimulating this stress of desire, this wanting. Guess what? That itch we demonstrated earlier. So how do we supercharge this stress of desire? How do we really activate that stress of desire? Well, one scientist discovered a hack to supercharge the stress of desire. Do you want to know what that was? Oops. Do you want to know what that was? <laughs> nope. What if I take a long, uncomfortable pause before I tell you? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> the unknown is fascinating. The unknown is fascinating. And our brain is a prediction machine which wants to connect cause and effect. We constantly want to connect cause and effect. We're a pattern generating machine. Because it conserves energy. When we know what's going to happen, we don't have to keep thinking about it every time. So when we mess with that, when we add variability, when we add mystery, when we add suspense, we focus attention and we, and we create engagement through variability, through mystery. And, oh yeah, it's also extremely habit-forming. Uh, one study, that research that I told you about, was B.F. Skinner. And he showed in his studies with uh, lab animals, maybe you, you saw his studies in your Psych 101 class back in college, his studies with uh, lab animals, in his case he used pigeons, showed that variability of reward increased the response he was looking for. So in this case, he took his pigeons, he put them in a box with a lever, and every time the pigeon clicked on the lever, if it was a predictable reward, he would get the, the, the pellet, the food pellet, every time he clicked on the lever. That was a predictable reward. And he, the pigeon would only click when they were hungry. 
However, when you added variability, so one time the pigeon would click, no reward. Next time there wouldn't be a food pellet. The next time there wouldn't be, and vice versa. Those pigeons clicked much more often. So this is where the concept of intermittent rewards. And why does this work? Well, because dopamine in our brains, that's centered around the nucleus accumbent, dopamine drives the search, and variability spikes the dopamine system. Okay? This is the endless search. This is what's so important about the products we create, having a sense of mystery, having something variable in them, because satisfaction, our brain is not built for satisfaction. Mick Jagger was absolutely right when he said, can't get no satisfaction. Why? Because our brain was not built to satisfy us. Our brain was built to keep us searching, endlessly searching, for the next reward, the next thing. That's what keeps us alive. That's what kept us alive 200,000 years ago when our species evolved. So variable rewards, how does this all come back down to, okay, we talked about this high-level neuroscience and behavioral psychology and uh, even a bit of evolution. How do we use this stuff? So I think there are three types of variable rewards we see in products. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. Rewards of the tribe. We're a species that thrives based on our social interaction. So rewards that we get from other people, cooperation, competition, recognition, sex, empathetic joy, these are all rewards we get from other people. These are the rewards of the tribe. Here's a great example. Mark Zuckerberg gets married and 1.2 million people like it. Social networks are built, of course, on social reward. Here's another example. Have you used Stack Overflow? Okay, great, a few of you. Those of you who don't, 5,000 questions every single day get answered on the largest technical Q&A site in the world, Stack Overflow. And these are not Googleable answers. These are in-depth technical answers that people spend a lot of time working on. I talked to the, the founder, one of the founders of Stack Overflow, Jeff Atwood, who told me a story about a, a guy who worked a full-time job had an autistic child at home, and yet they had to cut him off from using Stack Overflow because he was spending too much time answering these highly technical Q&A. So it's, it can be a very habit-forming product. Why? Well, there's a social reward system in place. They're badges, but they're more than just badges. They confer social status. It's about being helpful to our community. This isn't a gimmick. It's about being helpful to other people, helpful to our tribe, and that means something to the people on Stack Overflow. There's also League of Legends, which is an online multiplayer game that had a, a bunch of trolls on it. Right? They had this trolling problem where people were, were making the game uncomfortable to play. And so they instituted a social variable reward system where you could honor people, you could give them honor points, or take away those points, and they, they dramatically changed the behavior. But there's a bit of variability here. right? You don't know what the outcome will be when you post something on Facebook. How many people are going to like it? How many people are going to share it? What are they going to comment on it? There's a degree of variability. Okay. Search for resources. I call this rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt stem from our need to search for food 200,000 years ago in the plains of Africa. We're searching for food. Food gets translated into money. Money today in money, modern society is translated into information. Okay. So we all know about gambling. We know that gambling is addictive, highly habit forming. One billion dollars a day is put into slot machines. And the main reward system here is a variable rewards mechanism around the hunt, right? Money. So we, everybody knows this example. What about this example? How is this a variable rewards mechanism? Well, every time you scroll, what are you doing? You're scrolling and you're saying, okay, that's not very interesting, that's not very interesting. Oh, that's very interesting. Look what just happened. This is not too, dis this is not too dissimilar from this. They're both a variable rewards mechanism. You want a great example of someone who's doing this really well, take a look at Pinterest. Right? A day you have to scroll at least once. That's the action within Pinterest is one scroll. That's what they want you to do so that they can show you the variable reward system. Of, that's not very interesting. That's, oh, that's extremely interesting. In fact, look at this comment that I got off of a pin board called Pinterest Addicts. Got a little guy in the corner. It says, he's hunched over his machine and it says, scroll, 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 and he says, Scroll, scroll, scroll. That's exactly the behavior. It's searching and searching and never done searching. That's the variable rewards mechanism. Like yeah, see some people shaking heads. Okay, and finally we've got the search for sensation. So rewards of the self are all about our need for mastery, control, competency, completion. These are things that we don't that we don't find rewarding because of other people or because of necessary material rewards, but because they're they're self-satisfying. They're interesting in and of themselves. So Leveling up in a game is an example of that. In this example, World of Warcraft. And maybe you're not a gamer, but think about your email habits. 
How do you feel when you see that notification and you just want to complete that one little notification or check that last email that you just want to get to? That's mastery, completion, control. Same mechanism. But before you start putting variable rewards in all your products, some words of warning. Number one, you still must solve the pain. Okay? Putting in badges and, and points and all that stuff, gamifying your experience, still needs to meet the pain. And if it doesn't, it won't work. Variable rewards are not a free pass. You still need to give the user what they came for. And to do that, see the internal trigger. Right? The thing I told you about two steps ago. You still have to understand why they came and solve that pain. Second word of warning, there's no engagement with that autonomy. We know that as soon as people figure out that it's a system that, that is manipulating their behavior, as soon as they recognize that, they bounce. People hate being controlled. So autonomy is a prerequisite. You always must maintain at least the user's feeling of maintaining autonomy. If you lost that, you fail. The last thing is around reward or fi the finite rewards. So I think there's two types of variable rewards. There's finite variability and there's infinite variability. So the problem with variable rewards is that if they're finite, they lose their, their power in a way, right? So think about Farmville. How many of you played Farmville when it was cool? All right, a few of you? Well, what happened, right? So they had a bunch of users, and then users started figuring out the game wasn't changing very much. So Zynga went ahead and built a new game. Well, what did they build? They built Cityville. And then after that, they built Frontierville. And then after that, they built, they built Chefville. And then the next build. Well, it was the same damn frames again and again and again. The users were figuring out that they're seeing the same game. And what happened to the variability? There was none. Right? The games weren't social. They were really single-player games um, that we acquired users socially. But fundamentally, the games were single-player games. And they had finite variability. We figured them out, and then they got boring. So think about consumption of media is also a finite variable reward. So what happens after you see a movie or read a book? How many books and movies do you see more than once or read more than once? For the most part, after the mystery ends, after you know what happens at the end, how everything is resolved, how, you know, how the happy ending plays out, you don't see it again. That's it. It's finite variability. As opposed to infinite variability, these are multiplayer games, right? Things that are social have infinite variability. Why? Because our friends are always changing. They're always saying something different. They're, it's, they're not uh, finite. Uh, creation of content as opposed to consumption of content. So making something is infinitely variable. And communities, of course, are infinitely variable. So for this section, variable rewards are the third step of the hook. Reward types are tribe, hunt, and self. And it's critical to maintain a feeling of autonomy find infinite variability, and fundamentally alleviate the user's pain. Okay, last part, investment. So the investment phase is critical. And this is what differentiates what we do as people who build products versus just kind of self-help habit stuff. So the investment phase is critical for product development. What is the investment phase? Well, it's where the user does a bit of work. It's where the user pays with either time, money, social capital, a bit of effort, some kind of investment into the system. The investment phase is all about increasing the likelihood of the next pass. Right? The user has to keep going through the hook model in order to form that association, in order to connect the solution to the user's problem with enough frequency. We need that investment phase to bring them back. It's done in anticipation of future rewards. This isn't about logging in to see what's going on on Facebook. This is about posting something so that in the future, not immediately, in the future there will be some kind of interesting thing that brings us back in. It makes the next pass through the hook likely by in three ways. Number one is loading the next trigger, it's storing value, or creating preference. And we'll run through these real quick. So loading the next trigger. How do products load the next trigger through the hook? Well, here's an example. Anybody use any new? So AnyDo is an Android to-do list. And when you first use this product, it tells you what to do, right? It tells you, in order to start using this product, swipe to, to the right to complete, etc. One of the things it makes you do is connect to your calendar. And when it does that, the next time you're in a meeting, it pops up an external trigger, gives you a notification, says, hey, do you have any to-dos from that last meeting? So it, it sets 
the next external trigger. Let's look at Pinterest. It, this is, so this is an example of Pinterest hook. The, the external trigger is an email notification. Right? You log in now, after you've logged in, you've got an email notification that brings you back. The action, simple login. The variable reward is just, is communication or the tribe. I'm sorry, is communication which is a tribe reward or collecting, right? Collect, I, I believe it's about these objects of desire that we're collecting on Pinterest. This is the hunt. And then finally, the investment phase. What, how do we invest in Pinterest? How do we load the next trigger? Well, every time you pin, repin, like, comment, you're setting the next trigger so that they can notify you again. Right? This is how they bring us back. So that eventually, when we run through the Pinterest loop enough times, okay, if we run through it enough times, eventually we start connecting with an internal trigger of, well, when I'm bored, when I'm lonesome, when I need a break, I'm going to Pinterest as my vehicle to take me out of that emotional, negative emotional state. So that's loading the next trigger. Storing value. Storing value is all about things the product helps us do to make the product better. So that when the more we use the product, the product becomes more valuable to us. So for example, in the case of Instagram, content. So when we put, uh, every time we take a picture inside of Instagram, we're storing value in the system, it becomes our photo album. So that's a content stored value. Data. Every time we use Evernote, we're putting more and more data into the system that increases the value of it to us. Think about how difficult it is to stop using Evernote once you've been using it for a while. Followers. So once we're accruing our, you know, if you talk to somebody who's got more than a thousand followers on Twitter, man, they're, it's very hard for them to stop using Twitter. Followers is a form of stored value. And reputation. Airbnb, um, eBay, um, TaskRabbit all have reputation rewards that are a form of stored value. And finally, creating preference. So this is kind of the cognitive side of the investment phase, where there's kind of a golden calf in uh, design in the UX world that everything needs to be easy, right? I just told you in the action phase to make everything easy, didn't I? Well, I'm here to tell you that sometimes that actually is not a good idea. That sometimes asking the user to do a bit of work can benefit you. Why? Because we know that doing work increases the value people bestow on the behavior. So for example, we know that people who pick their own lottery numbers will trade worse odds. Why? Picking your own lottery numbers, filling out one of these SAT forms, is a lot of work, right? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to just push the button and it spits out our numbers? Doesn't increase our odds of winning if we pick our own number. And yet people are willing to trade worse odds in order to pick their own numbers. Here's another example. Dan Ariely and Michael Norton did a study where they asked people to fold origami, and they made it a little trickier, and they looked out some of the directions. And they found that people who folded their own origami valued it almost as much as an expert. However, other people thought it was a piece of crap. <laughs> so we value or we endow value to things that we work on, the things that we put labor into. Okay? Because as we invest, we also seek to be consistent with our past behaviors. And this is what makes the investment phase so powerful. These little bits of work that we put into the system make us actually view it differently. And here's an example. So back in the 60s, a few researchers from Stanford went out to Palo Alto homeowners, and they asked them to put on, out a huge three-foot sign on the front lawn that said, please drive carefully. It said the same thing, but it looked different. It didn't look like that. But it was still a big, gaudy, ugly sign that they asked to put on the front lawn. The first group, only 17% accepted. The other group, only 76% accepted. What was the difference? What was the huge change here? Well, for group two, they had, the researchers had gone to them two weeks prior and said, can you please put this three-inch sign that says, please drive carefully on your lawn? That bit of commitment, that bit of investment in this opinion caused them to then, two weeks later, accept the three-foot sign at a much higher rate. Little investments, big results. Because investments shape our tastes, preferences, and identities. Right? So the things that we ask the users to do after the reward phase of the hook, that increase value in the system, and I'll skip ahead a little bit, by loading the next trigger, storing value, and creating preference. So that's it, that's the hook. It's an experience design to connect a solution, your solution to the user's problem with enough frequency to form a habit. And just to remind you again, Atari, 
Who can who can say it? So we got trigger. Let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. So hooks fundamentally create associations. Hook cr hooks create these associations that take us from external triggers to internal triggers, from low preference to high preference, from low engagement to high engagement. And my hope is that the hook model is a canvas. It's something that you can use in your organizations. It's something that you can use as you're building a new product. After you have a product idea, and you're thinking, you know what, our business plan requires this to become a habit, you can take this, you can put this up and say, okay, are we fulfilling this, right? Do we have a product where we really know what the user really wants? Where how the user, where we understand how the user will get to the product? Where we understand what's the simplest behavior the user must take in anticipation of the reward? Where we understand if the reward is fulfilling, yet leaves the user wanting more, and finally, what's the bit of work the user does to increase the likelihood of coming back. Okay, so that's the hook. But now my question is, what are you going to do with this? Because the right feeling you should have right now is to be really creeped out. <laughs> because this is happening to you right now. The products that you use every day that you find yourself compelled to use, even though they may not be consistent with your values, are using this model. And I'm not anti-technology. I come from Silicon Valley. I love technology. I started two tech companies. And I'm really optimistic about our future. But it's critical that we use this stuff for good. I talk about the hook model, and I teach habit formation to help you build products that improve the world and also inform you of what products might be doing to your life. So I encourage you with this information to cultivate meaning. The world is full of problems to fix, and it's your job to help others find meaning. Engage them with something important, and to paraphrase Gandhi, build the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much. So before, I, before we take questions and answers, let me leave this up. If everybody has a phone or, or something that's connected to the internet, can you please raise it up for a second? Awesome. And I need you to do me a favor. I love feedback. So please go to this URL. And there's a very quick uh, survey. Very, very quick survey. And if you do the survey after you push submit, you get to go to the slides. So you can have the slides for the presentation. They're uh, up on SlideShare. And this, it'll, take you, it'll give you a link to go straight there. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Or give it over to Um, yep. Is that three or is that one? There we go. What'd you guys think? Hopefully, uh, you see some thumbs up. Yeah. I know when I first heard this, I was like, oh my god, it made so much sense. And then the question was, well, how do you build the answer key? Right? I, mean, I think that was the first thing that went through my head is, for my business, Glyph, how do I create the answers to this? So maybe you could just share your views on how people go about coming up with these ideas, testing them, and iterating on them yeah. for building stars. Well, first you have to come to the workshop tomorrow. Because we're going to be workshopping this stuff. So if you have time tomorrow, uh, it might be a little bit repetitive, but uh, it'll be a lot of new material as well. Um, you know, the, the goal of all this is um, to help the makers. right? So uh, I remember banging my head against the wall uh, for way too many years trying to figure out why aren't users doing what I want them to do. Uh, I know it's going to be good for them, like why aren't they doing it? And so the idea here is to generate hypotheses. The idea here is to come with a business idea and before you get all hot and bothered and excited about that business idea, if the business model requires habits, to check it against this and to say, hey, do we have these four fundamental elements? Can the user pass through this frequently enough to form a habit? And if not, where are we missing? What's the deficiency? So. I've yet to go to. A, I've yet to give a workshop where a company doesn't come and say, you know what, that's where we need to focus the investment phase. We don't have an investment in our product, and they go off. They generate, you know, ten hypotheses and they start testing. This is not a foolproof formula, right? You still have to test, and if you're super awesome, one out of four of your tests will work and actually improve your numbers, right? So you have to expect failure. You still have to buy into the the lean methodology of build, measure, learn. Hopefully this 
can help you generate some more focused and targeted hypotheses on what to test. Cool. So this might take a minute to turn on. My, my next question is, what are some common tools that startups use to test their hypotheses? Oh, man. Um, there's so many. <laughs> so of course, you need some kind of dashboard that, that focuses on the numbers you care about. So there's, there's KISS metrics. There's all kinds of different, a lot of homegrown stuff. Um, uh, you know, a lot of, it depends what phase you're in, right? So if you're a brand new startup and your minimum viable product is just, you know, I've, I've seen companies successfully use paper prototypes. I love paper prototypes because they can test your biggest assumptions uh, extremely cheaply. So I would say, you know, use the cheapest thing you possibly can to, to, to test your assumptions. Because they're, let's face it, they're probably wrong, right? Like, all your businesses will fail, you know? Statistically, your probability of success is pretty close to zero. Uh, so uh, get, get to that answer, get to why the product might not work, test the biggest assumptions up front. My next question, and then we'll take some from the audience. Um, so if you were to, I mean, maybe share this conversation or this talk with Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or any of the legends of Silicon Valley, what would they say? What, what would they tell you and what would their feedback be? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, it's funny because uh, I know that none of them have used this <laughs> because it didn't exist when they started their business. I mean, if there's one fault to what I'm doing is that if it's, I, I don't know what would have happened if these companies didn't do this, right? I just know that these companies that have these highly high-performing products tend to replicate this pattern time and time and again. We see it in things that are, uh, are habit-forming. Um, so I don't know. I've never worked with those companies before, but uh, maybe I will at some point and see what they think. Cool. Questions from the audience? What questions do you guys have? Shout them out. And it doesn't have to be about this habit formation stuff, right? If you want to talk about fundraising or company formation or whatever's on your mind. Do you think the people that overvalued the origami just didn't know the market? One more time? Do you think the people that overvalued their origami just didn't know the market? What do you mean, didn't know the market? The, it, the, the amateur origami holders who kind of said, you know, my product's worth this, meanwhile, it's basically saying this, I'm an expert. I think they were they were asked to sell their origami. Exactly. So, so they, they were they were given the expert, if I'm not, I need to check on the study, but from what, I, from what I remember, they were given the expert origami and they had their own origami. And then they were asked to sell it to the researcher. And they were asked, what price would you sell me your origami? And that's how they determined those values. What about someone from Quicken Loans? Like what what issue would you, you know, do you see in, in the way Quicken works online that you could address this with? And what questions would you have from here? Not really Quicken Loans, but um, amazing presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you. When you look at things like Friendster that came before Facebook or, you know, Hipstamatic before Instagram, um, I'm just curious if you looked at those trends and said, you know, it's because they didn't have the right user psychology, or if it's a combination of that and maybe just bad timing. Yeah. Um, it does seem like the ones that take off all have it. Um, curious on, you know, some of the ones that miss to what extent um, missing on some of these topics, you know, where, where they're not going. Yeah. So um, I, I have another presentation that we were debating which one to show, which is about like, the, fun, the, the fundamental things you need. And I think um, one of them is a process to discover to discover what's working. And that could be about what's working with user acquisition, the user growth side, or it could be about what's working with user psychology. And I think the companies that master that process, that were willing to, to build stuff fast, you know, Facebook's um, move fast and break things, was not a, psycho was not a, a, a mantra at MySpace. So, um, Facebook's mantra of move fast, test, learn, and then do it again uh, did not exist. So for example, I think one of the key reasons MySpace uh, didn't beat Facebook is that they were really late to implement the address book out, out, uh, export. So Facebook figured out how to export your contact list, and that created a viral loop. Right? That's when it really exploded and, and uh, went past MySpace. But that's just one example. I think there's lots of things that were happening in MySpace that the culture was not inducive to this move fast, build, measure, learn type culture. Yeah? What do you think 
what do you think are some of the common trends with um, initiating the trigger phase, right? So you can build a really great product and use this hypothesis to, to implement and create something that people will use and continue to create that retention. But I think sometimes we struggle with the actual product marketing, right? So what are some of the trends that you think that some of these companies have done besides word of mouth, besides going viral, to really create the, the broad usage that they, that they receive? Yeah. So. I see myself as like um, trying to help entrepreneurs with the engagement side. There's a whole other side around growth. And I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about growth hacking. It's kind of like the, the latest sexy thing right now in Silicon Valley. And I think that is rightfully so. Like growth hacking is a science unto itself, and it's all about maximizing and optimizing external triggers. And so I would refer you, and I'm not an expert in growth hacking. Um, but there are people who are seriously good at it. And those are the people who figure out, okay, what are all the opportunities we have to externally trigger the user? What are all the messaging, message opportunities we can put in front of the user? And they're methodical about figuring out, you know, build, measure, learn, uh, what's working, what's not. Uh, and there's, there's a ton of people who are really great at it. Andrew Chen has a fantastic blog about growth hacking. And so that's, that's kind of the path I would lead you on is, that's not my area of expertise, uh, but to, to look up growth hacking and you'll see a ton of opportunities. Yeah. Um, do you have some examples of some potential <laughs> variable rewards for a uh, for measuring uh, productivity? Productivity. Um, well, I'll uh, I'll ask you the same question. So you've got tribe, hunt, and self. What do you have in mind? What do you think might work? Um, I mean, you have. Uh, tracking as progress through through pieces, so um, looking through and getting, I guess, counts of what what you've achieved and things you've accomplished. Um, and yourself, which is the uh, idea of being monetary. Um, those are some, some examples. Yeah, great. What about social? Any ideas for for tribe rewards? Uh, what about what about? Uh, there's a company. Um, like in the, that's in Canada, there's one in Boston too that has a, a simple reward system for note for giving, uh, like thanking people for things they're doing at work. Let's ring a bell for me. There's two companies that do this, uh, where it's just these simple ways to say, you know what, this person is really doing an awesome job. Let me give them kind of kudos for for what they're doing. Could be another system. High five. High five. How's that working, by the way? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, so there's been kind of this gamification backlash. I don't know if you, how many people have been watching, like, gamification was really, really hot, give everybody points and badges, and it'll be awesome. And then there was kind of like, there's kind of been a cooling down period. And now I think it's kind of, we, we've separated the wheat from the chaff, and what works and what doesn't. And the lesson from that bubble, so to speak, in gamification, is that socially conferred badges and rewards work if they're authentic, right? Like, if it comes from another human being who I care about, it's authentic, not from a machine, right? So Google had, uh, they were giving out these badges for being on Google Newsreader. Did anybody see this? So like six months ago. And they killed it, right? It's awful. It's awful. They can't check it, and it's, you get points, and it's so It's stupid, right? It's stupid. I'm like, exactly. Care. Because it comes from a machine. We don't care about how a machine feels. We care about how people feel. So it turns out we did, you know, the people were saying for a while, well, the badge and points don't work. They do work if they're conferred by people we care about. If they confer about a tribe we care about. From a machine, you know, an algorithm that gives us a, a reward for something we would probably do anyway, stupid, doesn't work. Mm. Mm. So do you think Google Plus is, is, is winning? Do you think they're going to catch up with Facebook? Uh, so Facebook hit critical mass in years. Google Plus, arguably, a year and a half. Mm. Yeah, it could be, but it also could be that there's nobody else left out there to take them on that they can stick around. Um, that's, oh, but MySpace is kind of a different audience now, right? They're not going after mainstream users, they're going after music, it looks like. Um, I will say that these things are really tough because of the 10x rule. That, you know, the thing that beats Facebook, and they will be beaten, the thing that's that's going to displace them is going to have to be 10x better. It's not going to be 
twice as good, it's not going to be three times as good, it's going to be ten times better. Because, and this is exactly the power of habits, right? The power of habits gives you that margin that the next guy who competes with you has to be that much better. Because it's an ingrained habit. We're, we're, we, uh, we create an association that makes me use Facebook and not really care to try Google Plus because I'm just so comfortable on Facebook. Like, what can Google really do against me? Um, not me personally, but no, that's I so that's, I think that's the thing, that, you know, habits give you that. When you can create that association, become the go-to solution, the next guy has to be 10 times better. I, I, it's not a great answer for a Google Plus, because honestly, I just haven't spent enough time looking at Google Plus. I, I just don't use it that frequently, but I'll look into it. I have a question. Yeah. So, a lot of times people talk about carrot or stick in terms of rewards or, you know, getting something versus fear of, fear of loss. Do you think... What's your opinion on that? Do you think one is better than the other? How much does context matter? Mm. So, carrots and sticks are funny. So there's there's uh, it's been a lot of research on self determination theory. And has anybody read Daniel Pink's Drive? Great book. Uh, I highly recommend that book. And basically, the idea is that you know carrots and sticks are both uh, tools of control. Right. That both praising someone uh, and giving them repercussions are tools of control. And people do not like being controlled. Self-determination theory says that humans need to be autonomous. We need to feel in control of our life. And so I don't like either, sticks or carrots. Um, what I like is anticipation. What I like is, is hope. Right? Not the actual reward itself, but the, the string that's holding the carrot up. <laughs> right. The promise of reward, I think, is what we see in, in web products. Um, but there's a lot of research around how carrots and sticks um, actually lead to worse performance, right? So uh, there's a lot of companies uh, that set strict goals that we're going to be, you know, we're going to be number one. Actually, I think uh, was it GM that had the 23 campaign? I think what was it GM that had the 23 campaign that we're going to in the in the I think it was in the late 90s that they decided they're going to capture 23 percent market share. Well, that that goal. Once that goal wasn't being achieved, like once that carrot was, was gone, things kind of, yeah, things really fell apart because it demotivated people that that goal wasn't being met. And so carrots and sticks can really backfire if not implemented properly. And so with variable rewards, we, we want to try and make things that are intrinsically pleasurable, not just for the sake of, you know, being paid. Or I see this with a lot of companies that are trying to, in the local space, you know, let's pay people with coupons. Well, coupons are a very like extrinsic reward, right? Money is a very extrinsic reward. And what happens as soon as you stop giving the user coupons or, or money as a reward? They're gone. There's nothing inherently fun about it. Whereas these kind of variable rewards around the tribe, right? Social rewards are infinitely variable. These type of rewards are intrinsically pleasurable as opposed to extrinsically pleasurable. Long way of answering, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think games will be around forever. Right? Games, we, we have archaeological records of games from 5,000 years ago. It's one of the first things we, you know, humans do, <laughs> did. Um, and so I don't think that, that gameplay is going away. I think so that it's because there's a high degree of finite rewards, right? You get to the end of the game and you're done, uh, that you constantly need to turn through the next hit. And that's, that's difficult as a business model, one. And also, uh, it's very dependent on the platform, right? So we see these, these changes, these opportunities in gaming occur when the interface changes. So when console came, that was like a big interface change. And then when social came, that was a big interface change. Now we're playing games on Facebook. Then when mobile came, now we're playing games on mobile. Why? Because now it's really interesting. It's different. Right? There's a lot of variability about how it's going to work. But when we get tired of the interface, we're like, okay, we play this for a while, the variability is gone. Right? There's a reason we don't play Atari anymore. Even though it was a huge industry, the industry collapsed because people figured out it was just the same thing again and again and again. So the, the, the gaming industry, is highly dependent on interface change. And there's some talk about like, the micro console being the next big thing. Um, so we'll see. 
that why Apple's iPhone sales are slower? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> That's why. I don't have a good answer to that one. Maybe it's the next color. Sorry, right, let's move in the back. Yeah, I thought it was the kind of longest period that you've seen people be successful with. They're kind of like once a week, just not enough to form real habits. This is a great question. So the question was, how frequently does, it, does behavior need to occur to form a habit? And there's no good estimate. What we know is the more frequent, the better. And the, the number one reason, so when a company comes to me and says, hey, will you take a look at our product? We don't know why users aren't staying engaged. And I ask them, how often would you expect people to be engaged? And they tell me, you know, once a month, I, I say good luck. Because it is super hard to form a habit on an infrequent behavior. It doesn't mean your business is dead. It just means you can't retain users through a habit. You have to retain users with other things, right? You're not gonna get a spontaneous customer coming back to you because they've been internally triggered. You're gonna have to externally trigger them with an email, with something. It's not gonna be a habit, though. It's gonna be because you told them, come back. Um, so, you know, it's gotta be ideally within a day, right? Like intraday, even. Much past a week and you start getting into trouble because you just don't pass them through the hook frequently enough. I hope that's, uh, sorry, I don't have a, a, a distinct number for any, you. Any examples of like weekly habit products? Yeah, I think Amazon. So Amazon is not a product, product that people use every day. Like Google is a product people use every day. I think the average is close to 20 searches a day on average. So incredibly frequently. Uh, even though, you know, Bing and Google Seriously, can you tell the difference? Like, you've been, your mind has been, uh, you know, you, you have certain associations that Google is supposed to look a certain way, and so you keep going back to Google, but you're probably not even gonna give Bing a try. Why? Habit. <laughs> because it's just such a frequent behavior. You're gonna depend on it. And now you actually see this better, even though it's very hard to distinguish the two, I, I think. Um, but Amazon is a behavior that people shop on, uh, you know, once a week, I think, on average. So a lot less frequently. But I think the, the difference, so I wrote an article about the habit zone, and I think getting into that zone of even forming a habit requires a high degree of frequency or and or um, perceived utility. So if your product is super useful or has a high emotional response, then it doesn't have to be as frequent. So when, when, when I take out, you know, when somebody tells me about a great book and I've got this ready resource at Amazon, that's a very high perceived utility. And so it can be a less frequent behavior. It can get away with, you know, Amazon can get away with forming that association because it's such a high utility behavior. But if, if your product isn't super useful and isn't used a lot, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> Good luck. I think we have time for roughly one more question, then it's waffles outside, so. And, and I'm around too with you. I'm gonna stick around. <coughs> you didn't schedule for workshop uh, Yeah. Um, for the, yeah. I don't. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the the, uh, the schedule is um, the fourth track, the user psychology track, is going to begin at one o'clock. And if you are interested in tickets, go to DetroitMobileCity.eventbrite.com. There you go. One more. Sure. So I have a question about. The fact that there's like a bit of surprise there? Or, or, or just that, you know, maybe you'll pay a little bit more to get free shipping, and you know that that's happening. Yeah. But if you're not paying it for shipping, it's not like the money that's taxed. It's coming in from just yeah. like how it's presented. Yeah, so I think Amazon does a fantastic job generally of, of the action phase, right? They're masters of making things easy, of course, like the one click uh, checkout is, is all about the action phase, right? Think about what that did to, you know, BJ's model of what does it do to ability when it's a one click versus all the stuff you have to take on everybody else's site, that's huge. <coughs> I think the thing with, with, with shipping is, you know, they intentionally stop you to make sure, okay, you know this is what you're gonna be paying, um, because they want you to actually pay attention. It's ethical to make sure people know what they're paying um, before you actually check out and, and move ahead. Anything else?
anything else? Any last questions? Otherwise, off the time. <laughs> off the time. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Okay, there we go. So we have waffles in the making out there by five star chefs from all over the world. So make sure you stop outside with awesome ingredients, whipped cream, peanut butter, Doritos chips, you name it. So definitely stop outside. Um, have a chance to meet everyone. Like I said, we have cool people from Canada, from Ohio, and uh, it's a great opportunity to meet, uh, you know, startup CEOs or um, you know friends from the family companies. All right, well, thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time. Oh, it's so true.